Will you uh, put the hand in there? Oh yeah, in the last minute. I mean, uh, that's what it was basically uh, the last five minutes before uh, 10, right? Yeah, but that's a great way to, to, to make the final, uh, or to make some, some sketches, some, some sketching in there, and then you can check it later if it works. Mm. Like we talked with Titian that he made these enormous sketches. Then he left them for three months, and then he looked at them again. Mm. So. Yeah, I guess he uh, can, uh, in a morning meeting, he probably will look at it and decide if uh, it actually works. Mm. I was really surprised when I walked in and like 20 minutes before I saw it and it wasn't there. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so what the hell is that? I, th I think that's... Uh, Changed the whole narrative of the painting. Yeah, it does. And I, th I think that that's, that's one of the things that I've learned, at least uh, from studying with it with him that you don't just make a picture you try out all things possible to see if it can work and it does you're, you're never satisfied just because it's correctly painted mm. this is obvious you know when you've seen it so many times but for people who, had, who don't think like that it's a quite way, a strange way of working mm. <clears throat> To always try out things, move things around, and so-called sacrifice things that you spent a lot of work on. Mm. Yeah, in the hopes of something even better. Yeah, yeah. We have to destroy it a little bit. It was so great. Uh, I mean, to keep getting reminded of that, that you have to keep it open mm. so that you can make these changes. Mm. It's probably one of the <clears throat> most important things I've learned anyway, is that you can always improve at work. Yeah. That's uh, that was certainly not a question in other schools have been at. Yeah, how is that? <coughs> yeah, because you did go to the Florence Academy. Mm. Yeah, well there is but more that, like... That's more like you know ex more or less exactly how it's go going to be and then you, you go towards that. And Absolutely, yeah. It's like a linear progression. Right, yeah. And here it's just as we talk about in more or less every morning meeting. It's a circular process mm. where you you lose some and you you get some all the time, and mm. it just uh, it never ends. God damn it! <laughs> well, it was a student <coughs> once. It was quite funny the way he said it. Um, that you start with a sketch and then you work a lot with it, and in the end you paint a sketch on it. Mm. <laughs> <coughs> That's kind of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's uh, I saw this morning a uh, unfinished painting of Tintorello, and uh, it actually rem reminded me of uh, the way Odd uh, sketches in figures. Uh -huh. So it's this really rough, like maybe ten lines, and it's the whole figure, and it was unfinished. So everything uh, else around it was done. Mm. But uh, he does that. Odd does it sometimes. So he entirely wipes out a, uh, a figure he has painted on for uh, many days. Yeah. Mm. Sand, sands it away and then uh, puts these blobs of paint on and then says that didn't work. Yeah, I mean, the, mm. that's a story I, I maybe I told it too many times, but it would, was a, that was my first experience with that. Because mm. I, I went, I visited him like a couple of times before I actually started as a student. And uh, he was working on the, the male stripper mm -hmm. who was flanked by two people on each side. And uh, so the next time I came back, he was painting over the, uh, these two figures that were closest to the old man. Mm -hmm. Full scale figures finished. Yes. And he just sands them mm. down and paints the landscape over them. It's, so. it's painful, painful to watch, but uh, you know that he's doing the right thing mm. because, of course, it has to be that way. Afterwards, you always see it. Of course, these figures were distracting. Mm. But you as a student, you, you saw it day for, uh, after day, and you remember uh, the struggles he had with it, and yeah. oh, yeah. this uh, didn't work, and I saw, oh, this is horrible, I have to uh, change that. Yeah. So the, the whole work he and struggle he put into that, and then one day he wakes up and uh, says, uh, we have to uh, erase that. Can, mm. you, can you sand that down? <laughs> uh, yeah. It's also quite funny. <coughs> <coughs> was this uh, instance where he was, he was painting something, and uh, he asked what uh, so someone thought about it, and said, oh yeah, that's so beautiful. Uh, hmm. He understood he had to change it. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. 
<coughs> but it's strange uh, how quickly you get, how quickly your eye gets used to the mistakes. Yeah. And then uh, y it becomes more and more difficult to change it. But he is always prepared to just uh, destroy it immediately. Uh, that's uh, definitely a challenge, I think, for a lot of people mm. to take that step. No, I think, I guess, a clearest example, I mean, not, not that there's no one else in the world history has done that, but, but I guess the clearest example, or the example I can think of, rather, is Caravaggio with the, the martyrdom of Matthew. Mm. When you look at the x-ray mm. and you see it's like six, seven full-scale figures mm. finished apparently that it just painted over and then painted in new ones. And I mean, starting with something that doesn't at all look like the finished composition, mm. the circular swirling movement, has nothing to do with it. Mm. Or yeah. I, I can't see that it has much to do with what it ended up with. Yeah, but uh, the idea still stays the same in a way. We have to fumble your way to it. Yeah, and that uh, begs the question or, or raises the, the issue of how much do you plan beforehand? Mm. Because, you, of course, you do make these studies and individual studies, compositional studies and all these things. Um, but then suddenly you, s you see, OK, mm. something else works much better and you just mm. do those changes. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you can see also in his sketches, which are so extremely rough, is that he has exactly, uh, yeah. he has more of an idea in his mind rather than in the sketch itself. I mean, uh, we we did it together twice now to uh, prepare the canvas and then uh, transfer the sketch over to the the canvas. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> just uh, these uh, almost stick figure like uh, paintings are very abstract. Mm. I mean, it's it's incredible how he actually carves out these figures uh, out there w within a few days, actually. Mm. So, in a way, for me, that's the most fascinating aspect, actually, uh, to to watch odd uh, think. In a way, so wake up every day and you have the morning meeting. And you already see him glancing over to the painting while we talk. Mm. And see, often you can uh, actually feel a little bit that he's uh, directing the subjects he's currently interesting, interested in for the paintings. Mm. And then uh, after the morning meeting, you, he usually uh, says what what's the plan is uh, for him today. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, or he interrupts the meeting and uh, yeah, goes, uh, exactly, yeah, now I know what I'm going yeah, to do. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> when it ends then. <laughs> And then, and then just uh, every day sort of having the similar structure, but this, uh, this uh, finding of the, the actual narrative he does, this, this looking for the, the right thing. Yeah. So he really doesn't start out with a concrete plan, more, more like this idea in his head, th this mood or something. It's very strange. Yeah, and you can contrast that with how he was working in the 80s, I guess early 90s. Mm -hmm. If you see in these drawings, for Dawn or for um, Five Name Givers, uh, other things like that. And you see it's very much crafted, almost, it's quite similar. I mean, okay. he doesn't make those extreme changes. Of course, in some cases he does, but I mean, um, more so now, absolutely more so now mm. than he would do uh, in that time. So, so a yeah. little bit like his graphics then almost, uh, so a, a real uh, sketch. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you, because you can see they're not as big as the, the, f the finished mm -hmm. paintings, but of course, first you have a lot of studies. And then he would make, uh, you can see that he's, he's um, um, put together uh, different uh, pieces of, of like cardboard paper mm. to make, uh, make it big enough. And then he makes, really carves the image, crafts the whole image, like with the mountains in the back and all of that. You can, you can see it's very similar mm. to, to how it actually looks like in the end. Yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, it also shows in the result, it, it does feel more planned yeah. out. It's it's very elaborate, yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. it's it's really a change of technique. Yeah. You, you you really see that. Yeah. And and that's also a a challenge for. I mean, th this is something that Per Lundgren talked about. It, it, one of the first interviews I did down uh, in the cave. Um, how you can see that the different students are their technique is affected by the way Nadrim would paint at that mm. time. Um, 
And I guess that's a challenge. I talked to William Heimdall about it also, this thing about trying to go exactly to that rough <coughs> technique that that uh, all this engaged in now and think that you can master that when you're 21 or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, and that can lead to a lot of misunderstanding. So in and a way we come at the wrong time <laughs> because Sorry yeah. guys. Being introduced uh, right yeah. to this technique is absolutely, yeah. Yeah. you really have yeah. to get into them. Yeah, there's something about knowing that there, there it is and you have to go through these things mm. first. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, well, that's the weird thing then also with, uh, all of course, he starts sort of with that and then schools himself and then comes back to it. <laughs> mm. Yeah. He starts with the monk school and yeah, then yeah. went through the Caravaggio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's so weird. That's this uh, similarity between Munk, uh, early Munch and, and uh, yeah, Ad, early Ad. I mean, you can't. Uh, well, I well, remember. Actually, I, I just I say one thing. They actually have two other things in common too. Both of them have been uh, called a phenomenon, and both of them are re have been criticized for their uh, bad understanding of anatomy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it must be something uh, magical about that, and yeah. the criticism really stuck, and then uh, they both got into their minds that, okay, I have to get this right. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's, I remember in some interview you made where uh, you talked about how if you shipped uh, some Munch paintings and odd paintings into the future, the early ones, mm. uh, and you didn't uh, have signatures or anything. You couldn't tell them apart. Right, right. It, it's very similar, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that's so strange uh, that you don't think of Munch as an old master painter, but it actually was in yeah. the beginning. So you have this connection between late Rembrandt and early Munch and, and early and late uh, Nerdrum. Mm. <laughs> mm. But I mean, I think it's something to really consider this that rough technique is much more vivid, but there are certain things you have to go through yeah. before you go there. Oh, it's... No, you would have to, it's uh, entirely useless to basically start out that way. Mm. I don't think you can, uh, you can begin with this technique because no. you will not end up with good results. Well, I've, I've seen students trying it and it's been quite catastro catastrophic. But I mean, it, I think also if you understand that you need to have a clarity of form too, not just mm. poof, hide, as, as they did say about uh, Ad, he hid his anatomical mistakes in the shadows. Mm. Right? Yeah. Because it, but it can easily become that if you mm. don't understand, okay, I actually need to craft the form mm. solidly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you have to go through that, definitely. Mm. Otherwise, uh, when you try to make a big composition like he's making now, that's the thing about uh, Munch is that uh, he did, in a way, hide the anatomy uh, very often. So he never really stuck to this, uh, this uh, in a way, uh, grand epics that he was making early on. Mm. Well, Sick Child and uh, some others. But if he had uh, stuck to it, I think he would have gone through the same sort of a path. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're, you're back to philosophical awareness. Yeah. If you don't have it, you can, re you can easily turn out like uh, early monk or like, well, middle-aged monk. I guess. Yeah. Or a one-hit wonder. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But I mean, it's, uh, it's, um, I remember I was uh, going to to uh, study with actually a former student of Alts and then uh, I misunderstood him. I thought he was moving to Sweden. I don't know what happened. Anyways, so he told me where Alts uh, lived and I went up and knocked on the door and I got an appointment to come back and showed, showed, showed the work, and which was, yeah, I guess okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but <clears throat> anyway. Okay enough. <laughs> I, yeah. Let's not talk about that. But um, um, so I, I uh, started, and I think um, you know it's so very different from any kind of school. You know, you, even Carrier, Eugene Carrier talks about that going mm. to these academies. And when was that? Because he, I don't know, is it 1876? I don't know, forget when when he was born. But anyways, it, late 1800s. Um, and how there was this distance to the professor, mm. 
professor came into class mm. and then it was mm. completely yeah, detached. Yeah. Um, but of course, in in our uh, case, and that, that's that's so strange or so fantastic that he revitalizes his whole workshop tradition. Not just having sort of paying students come in in a, an atelier, mm. but having students come in not paying and learning and then learning by mm. helping. Mm. And I think that's the you know that's <laughs> like with, with well we talked about it sp especially with, with these school films that were made right mm. uh, how when you're pedagogical you sort of paint differently than what you would actually do yeah exactly and <laughs> and that's the great thing about uh, studying without Nerdum, that it's it's completely organic mm. it's not like color theory and, hour yeah. and then this an hour and then this an hour and then yeah. no, I remember the way he described it was so great that uh, you should just you should not uh, practice it. You should just breathe it in the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How to create a masterpiece or whatever. Yeah. It's, 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 you just smell it all over when you come here. Yeah, yeah in, in a way, it's more interesting to actually look at odds uh, in, instead of his brush. Because you can really uh, see the way he thinks and uh, while he uh, paints. Especially when you model for him, you can uh, really see uh, w how he thinks and mm -hmm. what doesn't work. And uh, he currently is working on the arm, so he has to change that. And uh, that's really interesting to actually watch because a lot of painters, they, they don't have to struggle at all. Mm -hmm. Because they have everything planned out and then they put that in and it's, it's so incredibly boring to watch. Color the drawing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. It's so incredibly boring to watch because everything is planned out. There's mm. no surprises, and and the art is just so extremely within the painting while he, while he's on it, and then he takes a step away, and it's actually it, it was very surprising to me how much of breaks he took during painting, yeah. because you would think a, a guy like Art who uh, has painted so many paintings, these large scale paintings, he's working nonstop from. Mm early morning to late afternoon, which is the case, but he's taking a lot of breaks in between mm. to, uh, to actually watch what he's doing. So he doesn't yeah. get caught up in the little details or actually sees if what he's doing is right and doesn't waste his time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and of course also this uh, fluctuation between canvases, mm. between... Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah, and uh, you see also the same process in the morning meetings, that it's the thinking process that brings about the changes mm. he makes to the paintings. Everything is thought out in a way. But probably once he actually begins with the painting, then it's quite uh, intuitive. Uh, I mean, when he goes into the painting and he's, uh, he has the model there, but then he has already thought everything out beforehand. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's a big change then as far as I can can tell. I mean, I would have to go, go back and re we should do that really. Look at the drawings and then look at the paintings mm. to, to see, <clears throat> because obviously they're not completely identical, but but I don't think it made that many changes as it would do now. Mm. Um, but uh, this thing of having so much experience that you you can really change the plan and very quickly. Mm. That you that it's not that it doesn't know where it, where it, where it's going, mm. but he sees that it doesn't work, and then so many times I've heard him say it, like, oh, there's something wrong. I don't know what what it is. There's something yeah. lacking. Like, I don't know what it is. It's been a pain in the ass for a long time. I don't, I don't mm. know what's going on here. Yeah. Uh, well, that must be a reason why he changed from this uh, way of sketching it very thoroughly mm. out, because that might have been like a blockage in how he was working. They might have stopped him from yeah. uh, further developing it. Well, yeah, and to the point when you come to the point that it starts to become internalized, so mm. you don't really need it anymore, then it becomes a hindrance. Yeah. yeah. But how was it when, when you were studying with him? He wasn't making those drawings then. Oh, he wasn't? No, no. He had stopped I, with that. I started in 96. So that was uh, September 96. 4th of September, yeah. I think it was. Oh. It's so a Wednesday, actually. Historic moments. Yeah, yeah, Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. <coughs> it's um, no, he, he wasn't doing that then. And I remember <laughs> it was so funny because 
uh, Pellingren uh, uh, was visiting. Mm. And uh, all that started a new motif and then drawing, you know, still drawing, mm. but, but more more loose. And then he was drawing and said, oh, okay, let's start painting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I remember the way uh, Pellungen um, reacted, it, you know, like in, in a, um, a comic way, like a f funny way about, yeah, it's too much work now. Yeah. You need to start painting. <laughs> um, because, of course, he had been a student in eight, 83 to 85, I think. Mm. And I get yeah. So that was a period when I think he would had started working on the, uh, or making this drawing stand. We should check it. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I think so. Well, then it seems like he has just been getting rougher and rougher in the times because now the sketches are. I mean, y y I mean, you uh, can see there we are can some mention, We can mention the the sketch we had to do, and oh, it was God. basically a sort of troll figure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is supposed to be a female oh mother. God, uh, this looks like a, some <laughs> demonic beast. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see really in, in uh, Odd's face he's not really satisfied because I in the sketch, I mean we l did a good job transferring the sketch, right? But yeah. He has, a, of course, a different image in his <laughs> mind. <laughs> <And then laughs> of course. They just so quickly, oh loosely <laughs> transferred on the canvas. It's not... Uh, yeah. and he, he wants to oh get rid of that God. quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Once we had finished it, he was looking at it. Oh, uh, <laughs> did I really place that uh, there? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> what in hell is that uh, figure? <laughs> <laughs> but then, once it starts working, it's like magic. Well, but even uh, even even within the first day, you can be the cocky student and say, "Oh, I could do that." Yeah, <laughs> that's not too difficult. And then the next day comes and uh, paints over it already, and then uh, oh god, mm. it, it comes to life uh, instantaneously. Mm. And the atmosphere comes into it mm. straight away yeah. with the figure. Yeah, that's uh, quite telling uh, that he already has it figured out in a way, to a certain degree. It was so funny. Did you see that interview I did with Joachim Eriksson? Yeah, where he talks about. <laughs> Oh, they painted this flesh color and then two dots for eyes. Yes, yeah, and it was like, is this is there a candid camera here? <laughs> what, what's going on? Yeah. And then of course it it changes uh, into something much better, <laughs> better, right? Yeah, mm. yeah, it's a little bit like it. Oh my! But just on a much bigger scale. Mm. Mm. I mean, the most surprising story I had so far in my stay was. Uh, that uh, Borg came up and brought him a shovel. And uh, I asked Art, uh, what, what do you need a shovel for? And he uh, s said, I think this painting really needs a shovel there. <laughs> and then he started sketching in, the, in a shovel there in the background, leaning on a tree. Mm. And I, I really thought, that's extremely strange that you come up like, like that. <laughs> like, you would imagine a shovel is, that should be in the plan already. Mm. but. Um, he tried it out and then erased it again yeah. because mm. it didn't work for him. Yeah, but it was this uh, the strange thought that there is a shovel underneath the these branches now. Yeah. And yeah. and in a way, all these changes and all these uh, layers really make up the atmosphere of it because there's more information in it than you actually plan out. Yeah. Just uh, through the sanding, I mean, there are so many details in there which you could not achieve uh, consciously putting the brush there. Yeah, you get the vibrance of the stress, yeah, exactly. the texture. It, re it really starts the, these vibrations. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and uh, th that's also something he talks about very often is uh, what props to use and what not to use. Like uh, it's uh, an amazing amount of details, but what's missing is also great mm. because he only uses the props that are like extremely uh, fundamental to the story. And usually it's no props at all. So like with the shovel, he took it out mm. uh, straight away. Yeah, and, it was uh, too much. Yeah. Mm. So... Yeah, I mean, uh, especially lately in his uh, works, uh, there has been less and less props. I mean, the latest works are just uh, naked people with nothing. It's a landscape in the background. Yeah. Yeah, and if you think about the sort of 80s, 90s paintings with these 
furs and hats and all of these things. Mm. So just so it, it's interesting. So he he went from I mean, it's depending on what year you're talking about, but for example, this, this painting Icarus that he painted when he was 19 or something. This man swirling in space, mm -hmm. like with a like, umbilical cord almost, yeah, yeah. which is completely out there, mm. and then. Uh, it goes through the social realism and sort of very present mm. and then into the landscape with this uh, clothing and then starts stripping away mm. the clothing and 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 figures all of these things melt much more together than they ever did before and so it's, so there's this sort of release mm. going back in in some way also to, to what he did in the in the beginning not just in terms of technique but in terms of of the whole uh, world view mm. But it really seems yeah. to be within the tradition of the great painters, right? Because as they grow older, they develop this sort of uh, sense for what is actually important. If you look at uh, Rembrandt or Titian or Goya, they all of them had these beautiful fabrics and these beautiful uh, golds and whatever, mm -hmm. and very finely painted with the folds. Uh, but as they uh, got older, it's it's much more just uh, blocked in and make, make an impression of the, of the cloth. Yeah. And don't even be too concerned with the folds. Sometimes in the prodigal sun, the, the clothing has almost no folds. Yeah. It's just this mm. flat surface in a way. And that is a basically a Greek way of thinking. Mm. I thought about that some, some years ago. I suddenly thought of how Greek Rembrandt is. And of course, Rembrandt being a major inspiration for, for art. And you don't, don't think of Rembrandt as Greek mm. right? because you think of the Greek gods and the, the, all these depictions. Yeah. Right? Mm. But, but the, the conception of form, flattening form, calming down, that is basically mm. what's, what's going on. Uh, that, that is uh, Greek. Yeah, and also the simplicity of the composition yeah. very much. I mean, the Greeks are more or less just uh, naked bodies with uh, a sword here mm. or mm. a bit of draperies here. Yeah. And that's all. That's uh, actually shockingly similar to what he's making now. Yeah. And uh, I have heard him also talk about it a little bit, like uh, uh, when he was painting recently this alien, uh, bringing, uh, well, I mean, it's also... Water would be, to an alien. Yeah, water to an yeah, alien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he was talking like, oh God, this could be literally just from uh, Hellenistic times. Uh, because right, the hermaphrodite, yeah, yeah. the stick. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because it's so simple and there's nothing showing what time it could have come from. Uh, yeah. Except actually uh, for a rifle on his back. But uh, <laughs> those are inexplicable things which I've never gotten an answer to. Mm. Um, like little shocks. What in the world is that doing there? Uh, well, to me that makes perfect sense in a way because it is sort of a collection of all moments in, in time, just because it's a rifle which appeared in this century or whatever. Mm. I, I don't think that actually makes much of a difference, because because it's actually really the point that the object is trying to make. Mm. And uh, I really uh, think it works, especially with the rifles, these paintings. Mm. By now, it, it's enough of an archetype or, or, or a symbol that it can be used, I think. Yeah, and I think, I mean, to a certain extent, there's always there's always variations, right, in terms of well, what kind of clothing, what kind of weapons, what kind of whatever people are using. So at a certain point, you have to use something. Mm. And of course, you can strip it down as much as you can. I mean, it's the same thing that, that uh, Edward Munch does with the portrait of Kali and Sniel, the, the guy with the, with the white... Um, Reflection in the, in the glasses, mm -hmm. standing yeah, like this, you yeah. know, with his, his stick and then with his... Uh, so yeah. great. Where, where he, uh, he uh, changes this 1880s suit into... Well, you understand that it's still an 1880s suit, I guess, but I mean, if you compare it to typical 1880s mm. painter, how they would paint it, it's sort of... He, he sort of tears it down. Mm. So it becomes something timeless. I mean, it's the same thing. There's a fantastic scene in Moby Dick where they pass a ship that has been out for like three years or so. And it's like they're seeing this sort of ghost ship mm. with these people in, in totally worn clothes standing there like from a different time, different mm. country or, or like a distant planet, whatever. Mm. I don't know. So you, you get that 
that uh, timelessness over it. Mm. Yeah. That's it. The <laughs> 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 <No. laughs> awkward pause. The pause. Um, yeah, but uh, I'm really interested to actually uh, so basic the basics of being a student of art. Uh, I meant to ask you, what's uh, changed the, the daily life and, and watching art paint and work and mm. also your tasks? Y you saw us paint uh, a bunch and you have been here for the past days. Mm. But how is it different from the 90s in comparison to what is now? Has it changed at all? <coughs> Well, I, I can't be exactly sure. I guess, well, we didn't have these uh, morning meetings in that sense, but of course we were always talking. Mm. Um, and I think that as far as I can see, the similarities are that the whole attitude to, to work, these things that we're talking about, changing things and, and always finding the best solution and talking about it and having the students come in, even if people are completely fresh as students and, and perhaps haven't developed enough skill, skill yet, are invited to to give feedback and talk about what could mm. work or what couldn't work, right? And like the story with uh, Apelles and the shoemaker, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah you could say, yeah, yeah. So um, I think more or less everything is the same. It's it's more the the painting technique that has changed. But I mean, I I'm not here in the daily life as a student now, so it's in some way a bit difficult to say. Mm. But um, with the painting technique, it's obviously been, been a great change mm. or development. And I think that's also a um, something to notice about uh, Odd Nerdrum, that he actually changes, he actually improves, mm -hmm. develops. Mm. I mean, p most people go with the one, one thing to the end of their lives. Because they're sex mm. successful with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't really get better or maybe it just gets worse. And but he constantly has changed, like we'll be talking about subject matter, mm. way of painting, mm. the surroundings he paints the figures in, but suddenly taking them in, into space, mm. it's like never being mm. uh, secure about these things. And it, you know, it, it goes back to this this uh, saying. I think it's from uh, from uh, um, who said that um, that the people who are it's from sports, the people who are really good have failed more times than you have tried. Mm. <laughs> you know, it, it's, mm. I, I think that, that kind of an attitude. And, and I mean, we've been talking about it. sudden great changes where we think, oh my God, it destroyed that beautiful figure. That's uh, the exact same thing that I came into. So mm. it's mm. just on a technically much higher level. <laughs> I mean, he yeah. uh, said uh, a few days ago in the morning meeting, if I wanted uh, to be successful, I just would have stayed with the brick paintings. Yeah, yeah. Because they <laughs> yeah. sold like, uh, not, uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's but the uh, funny thing. He was yeah. probably more successful uh, in the past when he was making these more solid paintings than what he is now. Even though we think of these paintings as much better. But uh, I think that seems to be the case that uh, when the painting quality goes up, the, uh, the, the popularity of it goes down, actually. Yeah, I mean, you can think about Constable, these so-called uh, sketches, the Rembrandt versions of these uh, six-footers, mm. where even in the exhibition paintings that were sort of more colorful and, and clearer, they said that he was painting too rough. Mm. Yeah. So, so it's very strange that this this way of painting has always been some kind of a, a stepchild in, when it comes to uh, popularity. Mm. But I mean, but there's a funny story about this bricks. He he had some uh, two three years. Mm -hmm. He had an exhibition in a, in a town not too far away from here, in this museum, um, and uh, changing paintings like every month or so. And there was a room with just the bricks, and they had lit them so that you c the light just came on the canvas and not on the f on the frame. So it was really quite uh, uh, magical, in that sense. And I, I wasn't there, but he talked about the Swedish art historian who had been there and came in to that room with the bricks and said, "Oh, it's like a cathedral." <laughs> and his answer was just, 
Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine him almost wanting to uh, tear it all down just because of that comment? Yeah, because of course she is thinking about some Rothko mm. thing oh, or yeah, seeing yeah. the art in it and so And that's interesting because when in the 80s, when they sort of started to, to so called accept him uh, because of the, the early stages of postmodernism, not, not what we're living with today. Um, there was this art critic who talked about was the the um, uh, is, is what's it called? Yeah, Isla. This woman uh, stand uh, or sitting there. She has a fur on it, and there's uh, like an iceberg in the background. Mm. It's, it's quite uh, weird. And he talked about how you could see the pattern of, of the structure of the ground in the foreground, like a mosaic. Oh, God, uh, so he could see something abstract. He mm. could sort of detach it from what it was. And then he could uh, like it, you know. Um, but, uh, and, uh, and that's also an, an, uh, a thing to talk about how it's not just the development in, in painting technique and, and motifs, mm. but there's a consistency in, in that in, in the same time that, that there's development, but there's also consistency in the way of thinking mm. and the way of not having this awe or Ehrenfurcht, mm. like honor fear of mm. the experts. Um, because he, when was that in 90, was it 97 or 8 already? Um, oh, I get confused. Was it an artist or art in, or art in America? He got the front page. And after that, he pays for uh, to have these kitsch articles as ads mm -hmm. in art news. I mean, most people would just then shut the F up and not rock the boat. Oh, because he paid for yeah. advertisements. Yeah, yeah. On the just put articles in as advertisements. Okay. And I think that's also uh, something to notice because you don't get there if you are very, very concerned with what the critics think or what the, yeah, whatever. If, you're very, if you have very long social antennas, then mm. you, you won't get there. Mm. Yeah. But that was, uh, that was a great thing. Uh, I mean, um, when you talked about when you were a student that there wasn't any morning meetings, mm. I think that's uh, one of the greatest things uh, being here is that morning meetings. And it also mm. seems for arts to be a very fundamental thing. Mm. Yeah. I mean, he often says, he, he constantly references what we talked about in the morning meeting. Yeah. Even, even uh, like late in the evening then. Yeah. But he found it very interesting what we talked about, and you really you can see that he thought about what we talked about, and uh, that he really in uh, internalizes that. Oh yes, yeah. and it's a little bit funny because <laughs> of some of the students I have uh, met here, uh, when um, they have been here for some time, they tend to think that it's a bit of a Groundhog Day, uh, <laughs> which we watched here. yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Because we talk about very much the same things every day, mm, yeah. but um, I mean today this morning meeting he said uh, Groundhog Day. It sounds like a perfect life for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? I no, mean, uh, I mean that that's what you want, right? Mm. Yeah. Be able to work with the same thing and, and improving and, and improving and, improving. and yeah. the yeah. virtue yeah. is in the improvement. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah and the, the ideas, uh, his ideas anyway, are improving and developing just uh, the same uh, like uh, speed as his paintings are, mm. you could say. So they go very hand in hand. So that's definitely been one of the, the best things. Uh, just uh, uh, these one hour meetings, which s sometimes stretch to two hours. Mm. Like one of the longest ones we had was like three hours. So <laughs> yeah. But what we did though, I remember uh, was a lot of putting books out and comparing different masters. So you get an understanding mm. of, of the relation. Mm. So it's not about, oh, Rafael is great, oh, Velasquez is great, or Rembrandt is great. You just, you just put them next to each other and you start moving around and you find this pattern mm. or hierarchy. And I remember we were doing that and he based uh, a lecture on that and talked about sort of the light masters mm. and the heavy masters. You know. And also quite literally, you have uh, Raphael or so very, generally very light. Mm. Good painter, very good painter, but I mean, sort of lighter and, and 
uh, flatter in the way it's not, not, not so much drama, right? Mm. Like in Rembrandt. And then you have, of course, Rembrandt, you have Titian, and you have these things on the other side. Mm. And uh, I think that that way of thinking comparison that, that sort of breaks all these time barriers. Yes, and the theory I, barriers, like yes. the modern uh, theory barriers. It's so great. It's like a visual way of thinking. But that must be when he started to think about this uh, geo, helio. Uh, no, um, that was that, that ego was geo. Yeah, that, that was in Iceland. Oh, yeah, we were talking about about that, and he was talking about something, and I, I uh, thought that this is something like ge geo helio. I mentioned it to him, and then he started developing these things. Mm. Uh, so that was in two thousand and three or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's a, I would never have thought about it if he hadn't talked about what he was talking about. So mm. It's like, it goes like that, you know. That's actually yeah. a really interesting yeah. point. Yeah. Because uh, you really see that uh, he gets a lot out of uh, s having students there. Yeah. So usually students have a specific interest. They come to him with a specific interest. Mm. Some are more uh, interested in uh, political. Some, of course, in uh, certain times of painting. Some come for his techniques, some for his storytelling. And he really makes use of the strengths of the student. Yeah. Uh, because I really noticed that when I was there for a, a month or one and a half months uh, with him alone, the conversations I had with him one on one entirely, I mean, entirely changed in comparison to when there were five students. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, he really uh, sort of extracts out what he can uh, can get from the students. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, he also said, has asked that that's his way of staying young, just having these uh, constant mm. different angles. Yeah. He's making use of. And he also really appreciates when you come up to his painting and say, I wonder what uh, would happen if you do that. Uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes he says, no, that's uh, not good at all. But uh, sometimes he <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's an inter interesting idea. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. have thought about that. Yeah. Depends on his mood. Definitely. Yeah, of course, <laughs> also on his mood. Yeah. Sometimes uh, he says something, uh, and then uh, then uh, he can uh, he can say like, "Oh, these young people, they <laughs> never know how to praise anymore." Uh, <laughs> and sometimes uh, all you do is praise. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> right. No, it's um, it, it's a constant. Uh, uh, I, om I almost said search, but that's a very loaded term. Um, never being satisfied with what is seemingly perfect. Hmm. I mean that that's it goes through again and again and again. That it he goes way past beyond beyond what you would be satisfied with uh, normally. And I think. Uh, I think that's the most important lesson I've learned from him. To all the time try to push it further, try to push it further. I think it's it's a fundamental issue mm. to to incor incorporate. Mm. Yeah, maybe we could talk about uh, how he does that because one of the big things is definitely comparison. Mm. Right. It's always comparing. I mean, he has pictures of painters all over the studio. Yeah and uh, books on books on books. And he's always also looking from paintings, what can you learn? But he's never directly copying anything. Exactly, he doesn't he lay down the painting books and copy certain things. Yeah. That's actually very interesting. But he more uh, takes a sort of a mood or an mm. atmosphere or... Uh, just recently, he, uh, he's working on this uh, father and son motif. And uh, he found... Uh, he, something was wrong, he was saying uh, this uh, typical uh, thing, something is wrong. And then um, randomly we were looking at Hans Gude, of all people, and uh, he found this... 18th century uh, sort of national romantic yeah. Era, yeah. And he found this strange yellow fog uh, to be something that uh, he could use yeah. in his painting. And he painted uh, the foreground with a lot more uh, um, um, bang, I mean, as he put it, yeah. uh, a lot more color oh, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. contrast. Yeah. So he finds these strange sources of inspiration. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, that, that's one thing, you know, if you go into classical painting and speaking of self-learning, it's easy to think that it should be really exact and true and, uh, you know, not uh, no messing around with anatomy mm. or anything like that. Just really get it exact and then you end up too so-called photorealistic and it becomes boring. Mm. <clears throat> so at this I got, got uh, a, a shock, for example, when he was looking at uh, Pierre Bonnard. Which is, you know, when you see his work, his best work, they really glow. Hmm. But I mean, you just see it, see them in books. It's like, what the hell is this? Mm. Because it's so naive and it's so so helpless in in the anatomy mm. and and all these things. But but he's looking at it. Suddenly he he finds something there that he can, he can use. So whatever it is, and speaking also what you said about uh, his relation to the students. He's talked about that, how you can hear a student comes in with that quality and say, okay, I have to remember that quality. Mm. Don't forget that. Mm. And I think I said, said he also said so sort of half jokingly, like the, he didn't say it like this, but something like the problem with having students is that, no, no, I have to be better than my students. That, that's, <laughs> that's the thing, you know, that's the sort of the, the quote unquote stress that he has, that it has to be better, you know. Mm. So it's, <clears throat> it really it sharpens you. Yeah. I remember seeing him talk about it in an interview where uh, he was talking about how young people have uh, sharper eyes when it comes to like subtle valeurs. Mm. And this is something he all the time uh, sort of gets a reminder of yeah. through having students. Yeah. It's like a constant whip on the back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah. You see something a student has done and it's like, yeah, okay, I better man up on this one right? yeah <laughs> <laughs> no it's constant it's constant and also this thing about icons like we, we talked a little bit about icons that's also wouldn't be like immediately natural if you want to be a classical painter and then you start going into icons and i think he said well he wrote in that norwegian book uh ordinarium's uh, canon um about Theophanes, I guess, mm -hmm. that his interest <clears throat> developed, at first he thought it was like naive and uh, quite helpless, but then mm -hmm. he started to see the, the potential there. And I do think you could say in terms of composition and, and structuring these motifs, a, a little bit also speaking about, or uh, uh, thinking about what you, uh, what you said about, about this way of composition, composing sort of being quite Greek. Mm. Um, but it also has something to do with icons. Of course, icons also go back to the Greeks and mm. the best ones. I mean, everything yeah. is good, goes back to the Greeks. But that's also a great uh, example of how he always looks uh, beyond the, the, the idea. I mean, uh, considering his views on Christianity mm. aren't exactly very positive. But that has no, uh, it's of no importance right. when you look At the actual work. Mm. And that's a great thing about him is that he's not occupied with these things that people usually think about when they see an icon. I mean, they think about the story, you know, there you have the Christ and whatever. But no, he, he just takes what he needs, in a way. Mm. Mm. Have you gotten some surprises uh, here in, in that sense, when it comes to what he's concerned with? Of painters or of philosophers or whatever? Well, I was uh, actually... Uh surprised with his lack of concern for certain things. Mm -hmm. I was extremely surprised about how much he dislikes Rubens. Uh, yeah. I mean, I personally also have uh, minor issues with Rubens, but uh, his are quite pronounced in a way. And, and it really makes sense if you, if you let him explain it. Because, um, of course, there, there's this extreme sharpness to it, and comparing uh, Rubens to a late Rembrandt, it's just day and night in the, in the feeling you get from it. I mean, uh, Rubens, uh, he calls Rubens often this uh, working painter. He, he uh, has a plan for the painting, he sketches it out, uh, or have let students sketch it out, mm. make the first layer, make a second layer maybe, and then the painting is done. Mm. And then he goes to the next one. And Ott says, you can really feel that, because there is no struggle in the painting. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I still think there is a uh, lot to gain uh, out of uh, the King of Rubens, of course, and he's a kind of painter. Yeah. But just uh, the way he thinks, he just doesn't take the painter for granted just because he has this grand image. 
he really looks at it and and tries to get something out of it. Mm. So he doesn't follow the authority. He he really he really challenges the painter. Yeah. Mm. So he says, Rubens, what do you have to show? What can you show me? That that was so funny. He said that it's typical also this. Um, his uh, wit or, or sort of um, so slight drop of sarcasm in it, you mm. can, may, may say. He said to a Swedish student something about that, oh, great, that's even even better than Sorn. Mm. But uh, be careful of all the others that come after you. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, so, oh, God, I'm better than Sorn. <gasps> what? There's people coming after me? Yeah. Like new people that are born all the time, and you have to compete with them too. Mm. You know, it's. Uh, I, I mean, who thinks like that? That's then you really. It's next level. <laughs> that that spatial uh, thinking. Yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, with Rubens, it's well, it's so funny. It's like we talked about the other day that uh, it suddenly struck me because uh, I was talking about the, uh, the melancholy expression being. Mm. Um, you have to have that because if not, there's no contact, right? Mm. And it struck me with Rubens, I guess, the, the Pelsk and the, his 16-year-old, uh, very voluptuous, fat wife standing there. <coughs> That's probably his most f melancholy painting because, yeah. I mean, there's so much lust mm. over there and he it's knows that they won't uh, last and <laughs> he won't last. And so it's like the closest he comes to melancholy is this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this nude. <laughs> it's like completely... Uh, I mean, it's, but he's quite detached from that. I mean, and, and that's one thing too. You know, it's it's... Uh, speaking of Sorn, so Sorn and, and Rubens are good examples of, I guess, lighter masters, masters, but not Rembrandt, not mm. Caravaggio, right? Mm. Um, and this thing about how easy it is to just, oh, admire, it's so well painted, it's so good, everything is perfect. But then he starts to talk about, well, the expression is so, this has no poetry, has no melancholy, mm. like, what, but, but it's so well painted, what, what are you talking <laughs> about? It's like, no, it has to have more, have more than that. And that is also something that you really can learn because it's so easy to, especially in our time, to not think of storytelling, not think of, of, of yeah, being a storyteller because you're not taught to be that. I mean, it's quite strange. People are concerned with, or too many are concerned with just getting that picture finished and it's a portrait that looks like the model. Mm. Yeah, you're definitely not taught that. I mean, my God, uh, thinking back to to university schools or like uh, normal schools yeah. it's totally absurd actually like the whole system mm. uh, where you as you said you come into a class and the professor walks in and uh, very often the professor doesn't even care about what, he, what he's teaching and the students are sitting, sitting there on their phones I mean uh, it's a whole other planet compared mm. to this mm. where you just go straight into the li working life yeah. of a painter I mean, it's basically like being a, um, what do you call it, when you're an apprentice as a car mechanic, for mm. example. You, yeah. you do the work. Yeah. And that's, that's how you learn. Yeah. And it's a perfect uh, barter. So he gets a lot of help and you learn by helping. But, but uh, I think you really also have to understand, be able to understand what he's doing. Be yeah. coming, <laughs> coming in completely blind <laughs> as someone who doesn't know and entirely how to paint uh, the fundamentals. You will not get anything out of it. Anything. Yeah, there, there's. And and he also yeah. will not. He will not push you. You probably will sit there the whole time and mm. uh, scribble on your paintings, and he will let you. And then you return. Yeah, it's not school. You have not yeah. learned anything. Mm. So you really have to. Really get in there and and try to understand what he's doing and mm. come huge. come with the fundamentals. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, and even then you don't understand <laughs> sometimes because, my God, it's no, so complex. It takes forever. Yeah. I mean, these are concepts that you can just go s s round and round in circles mm. with, as he does, forever. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to engage. Uh, there are, of course, uh, always a couple of students. I remember this one person, uh, and uh, I think she had, an extreme ability not to learn anything. <laughs> she, she didn't get anything out of it. Yeah. Mm. So, so it's it's uh, absolutely something that that demands that you are you engage, you get you are interested, you try to understand, mm. you, st you start to read up, yeah, and then you can get a lot out of it. Oh yeah, 
so you have to get into the hamster wheel. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's not exactly a hamster wheel. You, <laughs> no. When you guys get up in the morning? Um, right before the morning meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. You get up at 11? Uh, approximately. I've been up like five hours already. Oh, God. <laughs> We need, uh, we're young, we need a whip uh, <laughs> to get up. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> well, we stay, we stay uh, up early, uh, late. So. Mm. Watching uh, Oprah and drinking whiskey. It's great times. Oprah Winfrey? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it's like in that uh, Inuit story, this uh, older man is taking the young men out far out on the ice because they're so, it's so cold, they don't get any food anymore. But then suddenly he sees some birds out there, he understands there's opening in the ice and... He brings them out and the young man are just going crazy shooting birds and, and he says, oh, calm down. We have to be able to take all this, this food back. Mm. <laughs> and it's almost too heavy. And he sees there's a storm coming and it protects them because it's a sorcerer. So he can protect them mm. when they would drift off because the ice breaks up. Yeah. Anyways, blah, blah, blah. Point is, he has experience, has, has knowledge and the young men are, are just a lot of, <laughs> lot of energy, right? <laughs> so, yeah. And I think that, yeah, that's one thing too. Um, I don't know if I've talked about that. I think what you can get out of it too, at least what I've got out, gotten out of it, when you are, uh, because ordinary is so-called controversial, so you, get, mm. you easily get these condescending looks from artists or, or um, art critics or whatever, right? And I have to say, personally, that is was a major benefit because you really learn a lot also about human psychology mm. just by the way people react to him and mm. to you because you're associated with him. Mm. And it's not all negative, but I mean, it's like you also learn from that uh, condescending art historians that I've, I've, I've uh, met and I'm thinking... Being humiliated is a fantastic thing. It's the best way to learn. Yeah, because you you learn everything and they learn nothing. Mm. So you're you're just winning, <laughs> winning, yeah. winning all the time. And if you're not that person then who gets scared, of, oh my God, I have to adjust, mm. then it's a golden way. And I remember, remember him saying that uh, to me in the beginning, that something to the effect of, we have to know more than they do, mm. the people who are criticizing you. Mm. And that's our advantage. Mm. You can say, oh, we're not being accepted or not being celebrated, whatever. Mm. But you really need to go into things, think, re read philosophy, do, yeah, listen to music, whatever. Mm. So you understand more of what you're, you yourself are, are standing for. So that when you go back home, you can stand your ground. Right? Mm. Because I think that's a major major um, thing for people, um, especially people who have turned. And then later they, they accuse Odd of, of having made mm. them believe that this was a great big thing going on. Yeah. And what they admit is just that they're too weak to meet opposition. Mm. So, I mean, you, uh, it's a fantastic thing. If you get, you, you get to meet it, you experience it a little bit, a little bit, so, sort of like you, you get um, immune to it. Mm. Or you start to understand it, and that can really develop you. And speaking of of storytelling, you get mm. these motifs in your head about mm. what happened in that situation when this guy was l laughing at you. And it's like, hey, that's a great motif, you know. <laughs> mm. And then you can turn it in, into gold. Yeah, suffering is always a great motif. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> can turn into the suffering artist. No. <laughs> No, he's talking about <laughs> painting so you can make money off of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Ott said, uh, of course, uh, dark and paintings with a lot of suffering, they sell tremendously well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of that's, course, yeah. that's no. true. No. I've, I've sold thousands of my oh, dead bodies. <laughs> oh, God. Well, actually, I've <laughs> I actually have sold a couple of them. <laughs> Well, well, I've seen one probably here. Probably weren't good enough. But I've seen one here, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, two. Yeah. So, uh, one was a gift. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. fair enough. That actually is also a really interesting point because uh, I was surprised to see how many student works there are hanging in the mm. building. Mm. I mean, uh, that's uh, just fantastic to come in as this uh, mm. young guy and then watch all these students of different levels 
some really good and, s and some who are mm, okay mm. hanging on the walls. And uh, you really get a sense of perspective then. Mm. You really, uh, you really come in and, and already take it seriously because you see all these hundreds of students uh, hanging on these walls. Mm. And, uh, and he really uh, keeps them and hangs them on. Yeah, which is really you know what's uh, shocking about those students' works is that usually the best ones are those students who have turned into modernists. Yeah. The best uh, self-portraits on the student wall are, are often those, those people. Yeah. That's very strange. It has to do with social antennas and, and social greed. Hmm. Greed is good, you know. Yeah. No, I, I, I know. A drop of greed yeah. can be good. Well, yeah, you have to survive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, and I, yeah, coming back to that point, that that, that experience of, of uh, encountering the social expectations, that's where you make it or break it. I mean, make it not necessarily as, as in becoming a success, but having integrity mm. uh, and um, I know it's it's a tragedy what's gone, gone on with a lot of this some people just change because it's okay now it's a different environment but someone are really just scared mm. and and change because of that yeah. <laughs> that's an optimistic yeah uh, it's not an optimistic ending we have to find a better ending <laughs> come on uh, Yannick give us a punchline <laughs> Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think uh, it's uh, it's uh, great to see that how the students who have not turned actually uh, developed and uh, grew. Uh, for y you, for example, I mean, you really involved them. You're a fantastic painter, and the interviews here. But um, then also seeing st uh, students uh, like uh, Molly Judd. Oh, okay. now the painting one of the most fantastic paintings I've ever seen in my entire life from all ages mm. hanging in Odd's room mm. the, the girl with uh, the golden apple mm. I mean mm. this is uh, just absolutely fantastic to see and I'm quite certain a, a painter at that level once he's over a certain point will not change and if he changes it's uh, the biggest tragedy mm -hmm. uh, of course but just having this um, this masterpiece being a result of, of arts uh, teaching and having access to it, that's mm. just absolutely fantastic. And I've uh, stood in front of that painting for uh, quite a time mm. and I must say it's, it's amazing. Mm. So uh, I'm not too concerned with the students who fell off because there are plenty who are on the right path. Yeah. I think mm. the people who fall off, it's, yeah, it's actually not a loss. Mm. They are, they're, their hearts, wasn't it? Mm. Mm. They didn't have um, anything to say anyway, so th there's not much loss there. That's true. That's great. That's, uh, that's a German uh, clarity. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>